Why did the Coen brothers use the Odyssey for their Depression-era road movie? What is it about that poem that could enrich a story with three convicts fleeing from the police? If you think of Odysseus as the hero who engineered the fall of Troy, it might seem like a strange choice to place him here in the Jim Crow South. So what could Everett, Pete and Delmar possibly have in common with Odysseus and his comrades? People often point to the illusions in O Brother and the most famous events in the Odyssey like the encounter with the Cyclops or the Sirens. But there's a lot more to it than these rather superficial connections. In order to truly understand what the Coens are trying to express, we need to dig deeper into the Odyssey and look at what the poem is really about. Then we can make sense of this curious adaptation, which is my mission in this essay. First, let's get to know our main character, Everett. He's a notorious liar, and the crime that imprisoned him was practicing law without a license. Not a serious offense, but essentially a lie. The treasure he tempts Delmar and Pete with so they'll escape with him is a lie, too. There ain't no treasure. Fact of the matter is, there never was. Now, if you don't know the Odyssey, it's basically a poem about a king who tries to return home after a war, but encounters monsters and other obstacles on his way. After 10 years, he arrives on his island, only to find his home invaded by men who wants to win the heart of his wife. The Odysseus in that poem, although most often praised for his cunning, is a serial liar too. While famous for his ability to sack cities, he comes from a family of accomplished thieves and liars. He's also what we today would call a war criminal. Homer's other poem, The Iliad, chronicles his exploits at Troy, and in the Odyssey, it continues in the same vein. There's one crucial difference, however, which is that his home, Ithaca, is becoming a mirror of the many cities he's ravaged. After years of pillaging and stealing the livestock of others, it's his turn to have his own cattle and household be threatened by his wife's suitors. The Odyssey is essentially a story about the hunter becoming the hunted, one of Homer's favorite themes. He's exploring the nature of violence, and through divine retribution, it's now Odysseus's turn to suffer like he has made his enemies suffer. Put differently, his enemies were treated like animals, and now he will live like one. That's why many of the dangers he faces are mythic creatures trying to eat him and his men. If we view the poem like I've just outlined, we should be able to spot more links in our brother outside of the obvious ones, like the Cyclops and the Sirens. As our trio flee from their punishment, they're going back to their thieving ways even before the intro credits finish. But take note of what they're stealing. It's livestock, just like in the Odyssey. It's not only animals they steal though. Everett steals a watch from the character Wash. Then they take the car off Wash's son, and in return he curses them. Stephen, so and so that your neck. Go back home and mind your pa. It's much like what the Cyclops did in the Odyssey, where he asks Poseidon to steer the Greeks off their course. And in the true spirit of Homer, they soon become accomplices in bank robberies too. I'm George Nelson, and I'm here to sack the city eat a bean at. Sack the city? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? If that wasn't enough, he's even shooting up somebody's livestock for fun. Not the livestock. Many have compared this scene with Odysseus's encounter with the Lotus Eaters. I think the connection is rather thin, but there is a link here worth mentioning. In the poem, Odysseus's men eat flowers that make them forget their desire to return home. It's expressing that they're becoming pure animal consciousness, like grazing mindless cows. No wonder they're later eaten. So what's the connection to baptism? That religion is like the flowers, turning people into mindless cattle? I think there's a different link to the Odyssey here too. Delmar speaks of the baptism as a kind of cleansing, wiping the slate clean, if you will. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out, and heaven everlasting is my reward. But that's not what eating lotus flowers was about. A cleansing is closer to what the witch Circe gives them. 
She has the ability to turn Odysseus's men into animals, but also turn animals back into humans. She lets them become eaters instead of eaten. That's much more of a spiritual reset than the lotus flowers were. If only they could refrain from committing new crimes. But of course, they're unable to do so, both in Old Brother and the Odyssey. Odysseus's meeting with the one-eyed Cyclops is another encounter with a creature that sees Odysseus and his men as food. Whether or not Pete really is a toad or not is a bit beside the point, but I was waiting for Goodman to eat the animal here. He doesn't, but he certainly makes them suffer. He steals their money too, making sure they don't escape with stolen goods. It's exactly what's done by the Cyclops' father, Poseidon, who sinks their ships and what they've stolen. Now, the film has sort of merged the encounter with the Sirens and the witch, Circe, into one. In Homer, a Siren is another type of creature that can make victims of Odysseus and his men. The same goes for Circe, who changes them physically into animals, even though they already are on a spiritual level. She simply makes their transformation more complete. With that in mind, Delmar's comment is interesting. Sweet Jesus, Everett. They left his heart. He mistakes the toad for Pete's heart at first, and even though we learn he's unharmed later, I think the mix-up suggests there's something wrong about his spiritual state. And what about this line? We gotta find some kind of wizard can change him back. It's clearly another reference to the witch Circe, so do they encounter someone else representing her too? I think so, but I'll get back to that in just a moment. On to something else that might be harder to link to the Odyssey. All of the singing. To understand this aspect of our brother, we have to remember what Odysseus' detour was really about. On the first page of the poem, Homer declares that it's a story about how Odysseus and his men suffer for their thievery. Near the end of the poem, Odysseus encounters a bard who sings of the destruction of Troy. When he does, Odysseus begins to cry. Homer then compares him to a widowed woman like Andromache, Hector's wife whose child Odysseus threw from the walls of Troy. The bard's song transports him back to his most famous triumph, but instead of feeling heroic, he appears transformed into a weeping widow. This is Homer's favorite theme crystallized. The hunter has become the victim. And just like the climax in the Iliad, the tears are what's significant. The singing bard has encouraged sympathy and grief, and by doing so, Odysseus's humanity is restored. He's no longer an animal and is allowed to return home. So how is this relevant for the singing in O Brother and its climax? First of all, the title to their hit song, Man of Constant Sorrow, declares that it's a song about suffering, just like the Odyssey itself and the Barge song about Troy. The lyrics too contain similarities. It speaks of a man who's bid farewell to his home, who's been in trouble for six years, who's lost all his friends and his lover. In the end, it's their performance of this song of suffering that gets them their pardon. And I say, if their rambunctiousness and misdemeanor is behind them, these boys is hereby pardoned. It's tempting to think that it has encouraged sympathy, just like the bard did in the Odyssey, and that links these three thieves with the victims they have wronged. Now, these men have suffered too, but they've not become animals, and they're not eaten like the Greeks were. So what's the common thread in this story? I do think what we might call their divine punishment is simply a different kind of transformation. One of experiencing what it's like to be black in a deeply racist society. Here's why. Early on, we noticed that they are the only white people on their chain gang. Contrast that with the baptism scene, where those who are to be saved are whites only. Then, when they record their song, they first pretend to be black. Uh, sir, we are Negroes, all except for our, uh, our uh, uh, the fellow that plays a guitar. But soon after, they admit they're not. That's right. Yes, we ain't really Negroes. All except for our company. 
Later, the producer still remembers them as such. And when the sirens hypnotize them, they're singing a lullaby that has its origins in black folk culture. There's this moment too, where Pete is whipped like a slave. Talk, you unreconstructed whelp of a whore! And here, the allegory becomes even more obvious. They conceal themselves with mud to hide in the dark, but that also makes them resemble black men more closely. And then there's the Cersei moment of transformation that I promised. The wizard Delmar longed for appears in the form of the Grand Wizard of the KKK. In the Odyssey, Odysseus made a descent into Hades, while this might be a descent into hell if you're black. We gonna hang us a negro. They try to hide their identities using white KKK robes, but somehow the Cyclops sees through their disguise. Listen, Tommy, I got a plan. And when the wizard calls them out, he thinks they're black too. Color God is color. This feels like the Cohen's twist on the transformation that Cersei gave Odysseus' men. And finally, there's a lynching prepared by the sheriff, a punishment reserved predominantly for African Americans in this era. Note how he's not going to hang Tommy, the guitarist, but how the three men preparing these graves are all black too. Nobody else can go there. And then, just like in the Odyssey, they're saved by divine intervention. Here, it's a godly tidal wave, while in the Odyssey, Athena gave Odysseus the appearance of youth and superhuman strength to slaughter the suitors. Critics of the film have pointed to the lack of screen time for black characters, women especially. I do agree with the view that the film's version of the blind seer Tiresias and the Robert Johnson inspired guitarist fall into the category of what Spike Lee calls the magical negro. Well I had to be at that there crossroads last midnight, sell my soul to the devil. But apart from that, most critics have surely missed the point of the film, if you agree with the view I've presented. This is first and foremost a journey where three convicts learn to empathize with those who have suffered most in the Jim Crow South. And it's achieved by experiencing what they have gone through, just like Odysseus who suffered the same way he made his enemy.